Battle of the Philippines Shortly after the air battles of Formosa ended, the Second Naval Air Fleet's Storm Corps received orders to head to Clark Field in Luzon. Tomorrow, embark for the Philippines, came the directive. Other air groups were given the same ultimatum, but we went separately in several waves. Taking off on October 18th or 19, my squadron was in the second or third wave. The air bases in Taiwan had been hit badly in American attacks, and few zeros were left in an operational state. It took some time to repair the damaged planes because there were no parts. We cannibalized hopelessly wrecked planes for duralumin plate and used it to patch bullet holes in the fuselage. The color was different, making the mended zeros look battle worn and tired. Once repaired, we were immediately sent to the Philippines in teams of three or five. Who went when depended entirely on the state of repairs. The Model 32. Zero, which I had flown since Kasanahara was in good shape, so my departure came early on. My destination was the central air base in Clark Field. The Americans were already pounding bases in the Philippines, and we had to be careful about our time of arrival. It was preferable to land at nightfall to avoid daytime raids. We flew over the Bashi Channel between Taiwan and the Philippines and headed south to the northern edge of Luzon. A long road running southwards from Lingayan Gulf was visible from the air. I figured that this must be the Manila Highway. Several lines which looked like landing strips came into view in the distance ahead. I counted nine in total as I approached but couldn't tell if they were runways or just crofts. I soon realised that it was indeed the colossal Clark Field, albeit much shabbier than the fine bases in Taiwan. From appearances alone, my first impression was that it wasn't worthy of its repute as a great stronghold. It was truly massive, though. On the west side of the Manila Highway was a grass runway interspersed with white pavement. That was Clark's central airbase, the one we were bound for. I chose a line that looked to be in good condition for landing. Although Zeros had spring suspension, the landing felt heavy. The runway was originally made of concrete, but the surface was potholed and uneven because of shelling. The holes were filled with dirt, which soon became overgrown with weeds. I knew that I would have to be careful when landing from now on to avoid damaging my plane. I imagined before arriving that there would be underground shelters, given it was referred to as a fortress. The setup fell well short of my expectations with just a series of grassy landing strips. All of us were left somewhat disappointed. Aircraft parked on the grassy areas outside were always sitting ducks. There were some concrete shelters, but they could only house one fighter each. We kept our aircraft safe by hiding them in the bushes around Clark, covering them with branches cut from trees. This took time and planning. Nightly bombings, our quarters were originally built by the Americans in a forested area close to the western edge of the base. The building was raised off the ground with a small flight steps leading up to the entrance. It was spacious and very western. Notwithstanding, there were no beds or chairs, so we made our bedding on the floor with a few blankets and looked forward to sleeping soundly in our new home. This was never to be. From the very first night, we endured air raids by American bombers and were abruptly awoken by the furious sound of shells exploding close by. Frightened out of our wits, we grabbed our blankets and rushed down the steps to take shelter under a big tree. Even at midnight, American bombers could accurately target the runways and barracks from high in the sky. This was hardly surprising as Clark Field originally belonged to them. We thought it prudent to take cover someplace far away from its facilities. We slept under that tree for the first night. I use the term loosely and we were all dreadfully tired the next morning. The following night was not much better. Again, we fled the barracks and sought safety elsewhere. Some of the barracks were hit and burned to the ground. To the west of Clark Field was the Pinatubo Volcano and Mount Arayat to the east. Arayat was not particularly high, but it was a beautiful mountain. We called it the Mount Fuji of Manila. Clark was sandwiched between these two mountains, 
we heard rumors that anti-Japanese guerrillas were making bonfires halfway up the mountains to guide American bombers in their raids. The constant barrages and incessant worry prevented any hope of peaceful slumber. We relocated to another airfield to the south in the Clark Network. Our new quarters were a small hike from the west side of the base. It was a shabby little cottage of the likes seen in comic books. It didn't take long before bombing commenced in this area as well. And again, we were forced to run for our lives in the dark of night. At times, we even slept under the wings of our zeros. We reasoned that the pinging of bullets hitting metal would alert us to the need to bolt. It was virtually impossible to rest there as well. The bombings continued almost every day, but we had yet to see any American fighters in the skies overhead. This indicated to us that the American carriers were still quite a distance away from the Philippines. The Battle of Leyte Gulf? Intelligence filtered through that the US fleet with its many carriers was approaching from the east of the Philippine Sea. It was coming to support a large body of troops led by General MacArthur which had landed on Leyte Island in the mid-east region of the Philippines. On October 23, 1944, Bombers and fighters of the Imperial Japanese Navy's 2nd Naval Air Fleet made an all-out attack on Leyte Gulf. I wasn't aware at the time, but the strike happened two days after the first Zero Kamikaze suicide attack mission departed from Clark. Ours was not a suicide mission, but was a desperate foray all the same, involving more than 120 planes. Some reports say the number was 250, my Zero was part of a team tasked with securing air superiority to protect our bombers. We flew ahead at an altitude of about four to 5,000 metres, keeping a sharp lookout for intercepting fighters. An assortment of bombers made their way in formation below us. There were torpedo bombers and dive bombers to go after shipping and others to take out targets on land. It was a majestic sight with their wings glittering in the sunlight. Something began to stir inside me. I tightened my scarf and removed my gloves, securing them under my legs. I remember the excitement as I scanned the sky vigilantly to my right, left, up, down, forward and behind. A mass of black storm clouds came into view ahead. This meant heavy rain, thunder and lightning. The inclement weather would wreak havoc on our visibility and possibly result in collisions so we were ordered back to base. We were deployed again the following day, but my team returned without encountering enemy planes. I heard that some of the other teams didn't have such a quiet time of it. Arriving back at base, I left my Zero with the mechanics. I noticed a communications officer scurrying around in a panic. I asked him what was up. He moved close and whispered in my ear. The battleship Musashi was attacked and sunk in the Sibuyan Sea. The Imperial Japanese Navy rarely told the rank and file what was going on, so we relied on kernels of information passed down through unofficial channels or by word of mouth. In any case, I was gobsmacked at the news. Our team had just flown over the Sibuyan Sea and didn't see the Musashi, let alone have any inkling that it was in trouble below. Sure, the ocean is expansive, and we were short on planes so couldn't keep tabs on everything going on. Still, it was hard to believe that the almighty Musashi had been destroyed with nobody to defend it from the sky. Joining the Kamikaze Special Attack Corps, I noticed Zeros from other air groups flying into Clark Field during the day and night. We could identify where they came from and what squadron they belonged to if they came to our barracks, otherwise we had no idea who they were. At roll call each morning, we saw unfamiliar pilots in our ranks. Who's that? We'd ask each other. He came in last night. I remember Zeros flying in from Singapore and Borneo to join us. Squadrons seemed to be coordinated randomly, and we never really knew who was in charge. I heard of a strange mix-up where the captain of an air group originally based in Borneo landed in Clark Field, but his men flew to the airbase in Manila instead. We didn't care about their problems, however, as we had plenty of our own to worry about. Our planes were changed frequently because of maintenance issues. Each Zero had its own peculiar feel, so we needed to take care flying different machines. 
After taking off, I always tested the controls by pushing hard to the right, left and up to gauge the aircraft's responsiveness. I came to the Philippines from Taiwan as a pilot in the 2nd Naval Air Fleet's 221st Air Group. Completely unbeknownst to me, at some stage in the proceedings I was transferred to the 1st Naval Air Fleet's 201st Air Group. Most of the original pilots in the 201st had been killed in air battles east of the Philippines in the Mariana Islands, Solomon Islands, Rabol, Palau and so on. Suffering heavy losses throughout their campaigns, the 1st Naval Air Fleet was forced to retreat westward and its fighters ended up at Clark Field in a last-ditched effort to prevent the Americans reclaiming the region. Carriers made up the backbone of the 1st Naval Air Fleet, but its flyers were forced to become land-based as most were sunk at the Battle of Midway. Eventually, it was pilots of the 201st Air Group who filled the initial units of the Kamikaze Special Attack Corps. A friend inquired, Kazu, when were you transferred to the 201st? Your name is on the flight roster. I was surprised, to say the least. Really? I had no idea. There was another pilot who shared the same family name of Odachi. His given name was Umesaku, so we just called him Ume. The squadron leader and section leader were scheduled to arrive at Clark Field separately, but they didn't show up and we had no clue of their whereabouts. That's why I was never informed of my transfer. The system of command was in a state of utter confusion, invited to volunteer under the Southern Cross to die. I don't remember if it was before or after the attack on Leyte. One evening, pilots who had arrived from Taiwan were drinking rice wine in the barracks near the southern airbase. Just as we opened the bottle, somebody shouted two or three times, Fall in at the command post! It was not often that such ultimatums were given at night. We threw on our flying uniforms and caps and hurried to the command post under the light of the stars. I recall being in such a rush that I slipped and fell on a grassy slope near the runway. We lined up as ordered. It was dark because lighting was kept to a minimum, but the stars and moonlight provided us with enough illumination to see what was going on. The command post was a canvas sheet placed over bamboo poles, and it was surrounded by several high-ranking officers. Under the tarpaulin was a bench on which an officer of rank with bright yellow insignia on his shoulders sat. There must have been fourteen or fifteen officers altogether, and they all looked important. I hadn't been at Clark for long, so was unaware of who exactly they were. Something felt very odd. Around fifty or sixty pilots had gathered. Some, but not all, were stationed with us in the southern part of the airbase. There were also some former Yokaren acquaintances who had flown in from Balikpapan, Borneo and Malaysia. I stood in the third line but couldn't identify who was standing in front of me. Those to my rear were not lined up in any particular order. Airmen, step forward, came the command from a mid-level officer. We moved up and then the high-ranking officer in the tent stood and started to speak. He did not say his name. Without delay, he relayed the current state of affairs in the war. The reason you have been summoned here is because the situation is grave. We are running out of aircraft, and the time is approaching where our only recourse to victory is for each plane to be loaded with a bomb, and for you brave pilots to become one with your machines. At first, his sermon was rather abstract and difficult to follow. He continued, In accordance with the burden of duty and loyalty, we ask you to hurl yourselves into the enemy ships. We implore you to become a part of the special attack force. I began to work out what he was saying. Anyone with objections is welcome to make his protest known. I trust you understand the solemnity of this calling and can find it in your hearts to assent. Those who agree, raise your hands. This is not an ultimatum. You must decide by yourselves. Now. I understood perfectly. No one raised his hand at first. Not a word was spoken. There was just silence. The gathered airmen started to fidget. Those who agree, raise your hands, barked an officer, attempting to elicit a response. I sensed that those in the front row were worrying about what those behind them were doing. Those in the back were watching the fellows in the front intently. 
Eventually, a few in the front reticently put their hands up. Someone raised his hand part way. Others then began to raise theirs slowly, one by one. Sooner or later, all had their hands in the air. Of course, I did too. It just seemed to go up, although I don't know why. I looked up at it and saw the Southern Cross constellation twinkling brightly in the direction my hand was pointing. How many days do I have left? I thought to myself. Maybe one or two. I won't be in this world much longer. The vivid light of the Southern Cross is still seared into my mind. I have never forgotten that moment or that image. An officer piped up. We are extremely gratified by your willingness. Mission orders will be decided from now. After being dismissed, we sauntered back to our barracks in silence. I heard somebody murmur, So, the time has come. We continued drinking, but I have no memory of what we talked about. The next day, I was listed as required personnel. This meant that I was on standby for a kamikaze suicide mission. Although that was my status, the order never came for the three months I was stationed in the Philippines. I have no idea why the wait was so long, but expected the ultimatum to come any moment. Maybe it was because I was not an original member of 201st Air Group. Or maybe it was my age. I was only 17 at the time. On the night of the Southern Cross, we were asked if we were loyal enough to sacrifice our lives in suicide missions. None of us had the audacity to reject this volunteer proposal, even though we were told it was to be a personal decision. How could we possibly refuse? We were essentially cajoled into committing suicide. I am probably the last airman alive who can relay this story as it happened that night. To this day, I resent the way we were petitioned by our commanding officers as if we had a choice. Farewell, Shikishima brothers. Our second barrack also became the target of bombing, so we were moved again. The building was new and located near Mabalakat Airfield in Clark. One very hot day, we walked down the Manila Highway towards our new quarters. We were wearing our flying uniforms and formal shoes not suitable for hiking long distances. We also carried all our personal effects with us. After walking for a half an hour, we learned that some teams were about to embark on a suicide mission. We entered the Mabalakat airfield and made a line along the runway to bid them farewell. It was the Shikishima unit led by Lieutenant Yukio Sek. This was one of the first kamikaze special attack units appointed by Vice Admiral Onishi. They had volunteered a few days prior to this, and it was our first time to witness a kamikaze departure. It was not until after the war that I learned the exact date, the morning of October 25, 1944. The Zeros were lugging bombs under their fuselages and took off with escort fighters to assist them through to their targets. I waved my cap as they sped down the runway, knowing in my heart that I would be getting a similar send-off before long. I had just witnessed the departure of the Shikishima unit in what was to be the first successful kamikaze attack. As it happens, I was destined to be in the very last team to depart on a suicide mission on August 15, 1945. In the space of ten months, I existed on the precipice of life and death in the Special Attack Corps. After watching the Shikishima team fly off into the distance, we continued walking to our new barracks. They were shacks made of bamboo with makeshift roofs of palm leaves. The split bamboo floor was raised about one metre off the ground, and there was barely enough space to house four pilots. We made use of the blankets kindly left for us by the Americans, but the bamboo floor was uncomfortable. Adding to our discomfort was the perpetual fear of anti-Japanese guerrillas sneaking under the floor and stabbing us through the openings as we slept. We did have guards at the base, but there was good reason to be paranoid at this volatile time. Word that the Shikishima boys had accomplished their mission reached us that day. The escort Zeros reported that one of the kamikazes smashed into an American carrier. The direct hit was initially reported to the commander in Cebu, and this was in turn relayed to Clark Field by radio. It didn't take long for the news to spread throughout the massive sprawling base. We weren't sure, but heard that one American carrier had been destroyed and another carrier and cruiser had been crippled by the attacks. We were ecstatic. They did it. I will too. 
Give me a carrier to smash into. Securing bombs with rope in the early days of the kamikaze attacks, assignment teams consisted of pilots originally affiliated to the 201st Air Group, although there were a few from the 221st Air Group as well. One of them was a flight petty officer second class who we called Mr. K. I saw him lining up before embarking on his mission and was surprised to see him. Even more surprising was the sight of a 250 Kyoli bomb secured to his Zero's undercarriage with rope. Zero's were originally not meant to carry bombs. In some cases, they were fastened with wire onto hooks designed to connect supplemental gasoline tanks. In normal circumstances, the ordnance was attached to clasps for the simple reason that the kamikaze could ditch it if intercepted by a Hellcat. Bombs were jettisoned over the sea to prevent exploding on landing if the Zero couldn't find a target and had to return to base. This was not an option if the bomb was fastened with wire. It was incredibly dangerous, and we were lost for words when we saw it. We waved our caps to send the boys off. Before long, Mr. K's Zero returned to base on its own. I figured that he must have had engine trouble. With the bomb secured as it was, I held my breath expecting the worst as he came in to land. Fortunately, it was a textbook landing and the bomb didn't detonate. Like a man possessed, Mr. K jumped out of the cockpit and yelled for another plane ordering the maintenance crew to reattach the bomb. It seemed that his only thought was to somehow perish this day. An officer from the command post appeared and instructed Mr. K to forgo his mission. He replied, I promised my friends last night that we'd die together. I can't possibly live alone. I understood what he meant. He waited impatiently for 15 minutes while the bomb was transferred to another zero. Once ready, he tucked his scarf in again, hopped into the cockpit and started his engine. With a quick salute to acknowledge us, he took off for the last time. Mr. K was from the Yukarin C class, in which cadets were selected from Navy ranks. He was one or two years older than me and was always smiling. A 221st airman, he probably arrived in the Philippines a little earlier than me, but I still wondered why he was selected for a suicide mission so soon. Following repairs, our 221st Storm Corps came to the Philippines independently of the other squadrons. It was not clear who our commander was when we arrived. This was the case for many other aviators stationed around the Philippines. There were not many Zeros left in the 201st Air Group by now, so more airmen had likely been called in from Taiwan. Due to incessant confusion in the chain of command, it was hardly surprising that 201st Airmen assumed that all Zeros now arriving in the Philippines were there to bolster their numbers in suicide missions. I had nothing but admiration for Mr. K, seeing his determination to die with his new comrades. Still, Mr. K's name is nowhere to be found in the official list of kamikaze pilot casualties. Those who died in suicide attacks were posthumously promoted two ranks, but this honour was not bestowed upon Mr. K for some reason. I guess he was being punished by vindictive superiors for refusing to follow orders. The attack on Tacloban. We were given a mission, not suicide, to strike the American convoy heading to Tacloban in late October 1944. MacArthur's troops had landed there and were constructing an airfield. This was to be our target. The night before the sortie, I remember all of us asking where on earth Tacloban is. We had never heard of the place before, let alone that American troops had arrived there in force. A group of aviators arrived in our barracks. We didn't know who they were at first, but under the dim glow of a flashlight we learned that they were bomber crews for whom we were to provide cover fire. They had come to thank us for saving their backsides in advance. We had drinks together and our casual banter forged a feeling of unity. It was almost jovial. The scale the Tacloban attack was smaller than that of Leyte Gulf, but we flew in the same bomber and fighter formations. My job was to help secure air supremacy at the vanguard. Looking behind and below me, I could see bombers and torpedo planes in formations of about 20 to 30 planes. 
Far behind were fighters flying up to 5,500 metres ready to pounce on interceptors. The distance from Clark Field to Takloban was about 500 kilometres to the south-southeast. We were instructed to go to Legaspi Air Base in the southern part of Luzon, about halfway, should we need to make an emergency landing. Being faster than bombers, we kept an eye on the distance between us while looking out for signs of enemy fighters. I peered to the sides, behind and below, primed and ready to engage any who dared to cross my path. I assumed that things would start getting hot about ten kilometres out of Takloban. As predicted, land-based enemy fighters appeared from below. They were fewer in number, and we had the advantage at a higher altitude. We shot several down, but weren't sure who had made the kills. The way was now clear for our bombers, and they descended quickly to drop their payloads. Thick smoke from the furious anti-aircraft fire impeded visibility, but as it faded, I could see what looked like hundreds of ships covering the ocean surface below. We circled our bombers from above. Zeros were also susceptible to anti-aircraft fire, and I had to keep my wits about me to not get hit. The wing of a Zero flying close to me suddenly burst into flames. The pilot opened the windshield of his cockpit, smiled and waved to me before making a sudden dive. Seeing this, I thought, he's got the right idea, I'll do the same if I get blasted. Being from a different squadron, I wasn't sure who the pilot was, but he clearly knew that returning to base was out of the question. The smoke prevented me from verifying if he was able to smash into an enemy ship. We still had air supremacy, however, and our bombers were able to complete their job. All bombers returned to base unharmed. In this sense, the mission was a rare success, but we were unable to gauge how many target ships had been destroyed because of the smoke. We made repeated attacks on Takloban, but the Americans fought back hard. We realised then that American carriers we thought had already been destroyed near Taiwan were still very much in the game strafed by a hellcat. After returning from the Takloban raid, I left my Zero in the hands of mechanics and headed to the command post to report in. A horrible feeling suddenly came over me. Doing double time along the airstrip, I instinctively looked back to see a hellcat swooping in very low from behind. I couldn't even hear the roar of the engine due to the direction of the wind. As I ran, I kept an eye on him to see if I was in his firing line. It seemed that I was, so I leapt out of the way and lay flat on the ground the instant he let rip with his cannons. The bullets kicked up clouds of dirt around me. I was very lucky to come out unscathed and resented the Hellcat pilot for shooting at targets on the ground. I was shot at by another Hellcat some days later. We had been confined to the airbase, so five or six of us decided to head into town down the Manila Highway in our flight uniforms. Again, we sensed something behind us, and sure enough, a Hellcat was approaching in attack mode. We kept walking, pretending not to notice, while carefully estimating the distance between us. One of the boys shouted, Now! and we all jumped into bushes on the side of the road just as the Hellcat unleashed. Fortunately, the bullets sprayed around us. There was no time to look as we jumped, and it happened that the bush we took refuge in was a huge cactus. It was a few metres high with needles more than ten semipillars long. The thorns pierced my face and back, and pain shot through my whole body. I was lucky my eyes weren't gouged out. We had no idea that such big cacti grew in the Philippines and were left mightily pissed off and bloody. We escaped death because we knew how fighters operated and their range. Machine guns were fixed to the body and wings. The attacker couldn't follow if the target made a sudden sideways movement. If the target moved too early, however, the pilot would have time to adjust, which is why we kept walking normally until the very last second. We talked of the need for eyes in the back of our head and never ventured into the township again, for that would be a suicide mission in its own right. Like birds of prey hunting alone, American pilots seemed to have no qualms about seeking out easy ground targets. To us, this was dirty fighting. I, for one, would never shoot at the enemy in such a way, and I never heard of any other Japanese pilots who did. War is full of atrocities, and Japan committed its share. 
But for us, fighting was to be conducted in the air, plane against plane. The samurai of feudal Japan were not afraid of an honourable death in battle. Neither were we. The reality of our precarious existence now was that we might be exterminated at any moment without even leaving a trace. There was no honour in that. Sortie days. We made sorties almost every day in the Philippines. I was third airman in my section, and our leader was a lieutenant who had graduated from the Naval Academy. One section consisted of four fighters, but the number of planes in escort missions depended on the circumstances. Sometimes there would be eight aircraft, and sometimes twenty-four. We would circle our bases at 5,000 metres, keeping a vigilant eye out for enemy planes, or take turns escorting convoys southwards in the western area of the Philippine Sea. We never heard back if the convoys arrived at their destinations, but we did if they had been attacked and sunk after we had done our bit. If the order came to scramble, we would take off into the wind to get airborne as quick as possible. Sometimes we would have to contravene the very basics of flying if the enemy was in the vicinity, and just getting in the air could be a major undertaking. One time when we received information that Americans were coming to attack our bases, we scrambled our zeros and headed to the west coast over Pinatubo Volcano. We climbed up 6,000 to 7,000 metres to secure the advantage and hovered in the airspace above our bases ready to intercept the bombers. As soon as we identified the enemy, we dove straight at them. They scattered and escaped, but were clearly surprised at being ambushed from above. Moments like these kept our morale up, our ace. We frequently embarked on sorties with other sections. In one of the accompanying teams there was an energetic, distinguished captain with a baritone voice. I asked who he was. That's Lieutenant Naoshi Kano. I certainly knew the name. He was a famous shoot-down king. He always took the lead when we flew with him and was strikingly aggressive. When young airmen were resting in the barracks, he would sit down on the floor among them and make idle chit-chat. You boys doing, okay? he would ask. Rest up good, lads. One time I saw him laughing. You screwed up because... He would teach junior pilots with humour and good cheer and the younger airmen would gather around him with bottles of cider as if they hadn't a care in the world. I never had a chance to talk to him directly, but he reminded me of the famous samurai hero Isami Kondo of the Shinsengumi. I really wished to be a part of his team. Among all the Naval Academy graduates, his star shone the brightest, lost zeros. American bombings intensified and we were attacked several times throughout the day and night. They were nervous times for us, with hardly a moment when we felt safe. The difference between the might of America and Japan was never clearer. We tried to conceal as many planes as we could in shelters, but were forced to hide many more in the forest under makeshift coverings of leaves. It was difficult to hide them all, and we had to leave some beside the runway, which meant that they were doomed. After each raid, we rushed over to check on our planes. Having been at Clark Field longer than the other pilots, my Zero survived the bombardments because I knew the best spots to hide it. Without the advantage of local knowledge aircraft belonging to latecomers, inevitably became sitting ducks. The attrition of operational planes meant that a fair few airmen were without rides. This in turn led to a change in mood in our squadron, as it reduced the likelihood of being selected for suicide missions. Whose turn is it for the next sortie? Must be the teams from Borneo or Singapore, because they haven't done much of late. The fact that such words escaped our lips was a sign that we were losing our resolve to make that last suicide mission. In fact, any kind of mission was out of the question before long, because all our zeros were wiped out in the bombings. I was constantly drenched in sweat because of the climate but there were no baths or showers to rinse away the grime. Not once did I have a real shower in three and a half months in the Philippines. We all stunk to high heaven and were constantly plagued by itches because of scabies. There was no medicine to relieve us of the discomfort. One time we decided to tempt fate and bathe in a nearby river during a lull in the bombings. We immersed ourselves in turns thinking it unwise to all go in together. 
Ignoring the buffaloes soaking in the muddy water close by, we washed ourselves as quickly as we could. It was only ten minutes or so, but it felt so very good. I had not shaved or cut my hair and looked like a wild mountain man. Some cut their beards unevenly with scissors, but this made them look even more scraggly. Rarely could we even wash our underwear. We just threw them away and made fresh pairs out of old hand towels. Mr. Takeo Shinmyo. There was a distinguished reporter from the Mainichi Daily News in Clark Field. His name was Takeo Shinmyo. Mr. Shinmyo followed us around throughout the day taking photographs and looking for stories. We became quite friendly with him. He was a kindly man who could connect with the airmen and proffered insights that most of us were oblivious to. He was very attuned to what was going on around him and had the lowdown on all the crews. He was a useful source of information. Being much older than us, Mr. Shinmyo became a surrogate father figure, and we felt at ease opening up to him when he joined us for drinks in our barracks. He would always inquire if there was anything he could do to help. If you need me to pass on something to your families, anybody assigned a suicide mission would go and see dear old Mr. Shinmyo. I will depart on my last mission tomorrow. So long, Shinmyo-san. Although there were reporters from other media organisations among us, the only one I remember is Shinmyo-san. The others didn't really show much interest in us, mostly fraternising instead with the officers who decided on the rosters. We were aware of this and gave them a cold shoulder, even if they did attempt to talk with us. Mainly young men themselves, they seemed to be indifferent to airmen, about to perish for their country. I saw Shinmyo-san on many occasions after the war. I was coordinator for veterans of the 205th Air Group, and we continue holding annual memorials for our fallen comrades to this day. Although he was never sent formal invitations, not once did he miss a gathering. I believe he was the only outsider who truly understood the hearts of kamikaze pilots. Head for the hills. As if the daily bombings were not stressful enough, I also came down with malaria. With a fever of around 38 to 40 degrees, I trembled uncontrollably for quite some time. Hygiene was bad, and our resistance to illness was low because of poor nutrition. A steady flow of airmen became disease-ridden. Sleeping in shabby bamboo huts or under trees left use susceptible to the vicious mosquitoes, who injected use mercilessly with their poison. They were much bigger than their cousins in Japan, and the loud buzzing sound was ominous. We had long run out of pyrethrum coils, so it was a smorgasbord of blood for the ferocious disease carriers. The army physician gave us quinine tablets from his limited supply and told us to take them with water, but that was also dangerous. There was some boiled water, but not nearly enough to cater for our needs. We had no choice other than to drink creek water, which inevitably gave us bad diarrhoea and other ailments. The quinine never worked for me. It lowered my fever slightly, but did little else. Still, some of the men didn't take their medicine at all and ended up dying from some horrible disease. Just as I started to feel better, I would be knocked back again with a high fever. This happened over and over, and I always had the shakes. I hated the nights because I knew that squadrons of voracious mosquitoes would be out in force. We were dead tired, but there was little we could do to alleviate the suffering. Even the physician threw his hands up in despair. Some kamikaze pilots embarked on their final missions writhing dreadfully from the effects of malaria. In January 1945, American troops began to arrive in the Lingayen Gulf, about 200 kilometres northeast of Clark Field. As MacArthur had already landed in Leyte three months earlier, this meant we would be attacked from both the north and south. Many personnel from both the Navy and the Army were now stationed in Clark Field. Most had no choice but to remain as the enemy encroached, so we were ordered to hunker down in the surrounding mountains to fight. The majority of pilots in Clark Field were dispatched to Tugegarau Air Base, located in the north of Luzon Island, about 400 kilometres away. They were directed to go by foot over the mountain paths as American troops had already arrived in Lingayen Gulf and were heading toward Manila. 
The pilots avoided confrontation and traversed the mountains running parallel to Manila Highway. I can only imagine how uncomfortable they were trekking over this inhospitable terrain in flying uniforms. I heard that some of them were picked up by army trucks, but most made the arduous journey on foot with few provisions and constantly under threat of guerrilla attacks. The ones who made it to Tugegarao were flown back to Taiwan. Airmen who succumbed to malaria and other serious maladies remained in Clark Field. I was hospitalised at the base infirmary, which was essentially a makeshift tent. We couldn't move, and the quinine was all gone. Being in no condition to defend ourselves, we saw little way out of our dire predicament. Despite our decrepit states, we too were ordered to head for the hills when the field hospital was about to be closed. Remaining pilots were instructed to join the ground, fighting with the infantrymen. I was still crippled by a high fever, but had no choice other than to go with them. It was mid-January 1945. We headed to Pinatubo Mountain, west of Clark Field, where a temporary relief facility was set up. Maintenance crew members who had malaria were there also. In all, there were about 20 of us, and I sensed that we were sent there to try and recover rather than gear up to repel the Americans. After all, we wouldn't have been able to put up much of a fight. After orders to head for the hills were issued, Plainless airmen became the target of bullying by other soldiers. Maintenance crew and army men were bitter about the high and mighty pilots and made us carry the supplies. Otherwise, you can go ahead and starve for all we care. They made all the pilots lug heavy bags of rice weighing almost 60 kilograms each, even the ones suffering from malaria. We weren't used to such heavy lifting and ascending the narrow mountain path was a gruelling affair. With no leeway for personal effects, the only other thing I carried was my pistol and a handful of bullets. Mount Pinatubo was covered in thick volcanic rock. It was steep and overlaid with jungle. We climbed a little, rested, climbed a little, rested again. I had a splitting headache and broke into a cold sweat. Totally dejected by this stage, I wondered how many days I had left in me. We were literally on a knife's edge and staring death in the face. I felt utterly defeated. Somehow, we managed to climb up to around 600 metres, but certainly didn't feel any safer, and the sadistic mosquitoes were as ubiquitous as ever. We cut bamboo and laid the branches between rocks to sleep on. All we could do was sleep and eat boiled rice mixed with wheat or other kinds of grain. Our cheeks sunk, our hair and beards were unkempt, but our eyes were still surprisingly sharp. The younger volunteer soldiers were relatively energetic, but the older men in their thirties or forties were completely sapped. As time passed, order among the men started to crumble. We didn't really know who was in charge and couldn't operate as an effective combat unit. Amidst the chaos, it was the cooks who wielded the most power as they controlled the food and provisions. It looked as if they were looking after themselves first and giving us the leftovers. Even the cooks, who had always been kind to us, had completely changed in demeanour. One of them came over and said, You pilots were always arrogant bastards when you had your planes, but you're nothing without them. You're only getting half rations. Some ground crew personnel tried to stand up for us, but others treated us as if we were the enemy. Machine guns, which had been removed from planes, were set up among the rocks. The problem was that there was little ammunition. The army men had rifles, but maintenance and catering personnel carried nothing to fight with except their spanners, rice spatulas. The pistols that pilots carried were 1939 models, and each of us was issued with two in case we had to fight after crash landing. They had long barrels and were fairly accurate. I inserted them on either side of my belt and kept the bullets in my pocket. More than shooting the enemy, those pistols were useful for hunting birds or animals for food. Wild boars were abundant in the mountains and they made for good tucker. The possibility of having to fight Americans was always in the back of my mind, but I didn't think about the consequences if all my bullets were spent getting food. It was impossible to predict what was in store, but if I was going to die in this accursed war, I just wished it was in the air, not in the mud. The narrowest of escapes. 
communication soldiers were neutral to us and provided information. Almost two weeks after taking cover in the mountains, one of the communications officers came to me with some new intel. All airmen were to be transferred to Taiwan. The last transport plane was scheduled to arrive in a few days at midnight. News that only pilots would be flown out reached the ears of the other troops. A strange, almost hostile mood came over them. You'll get fed well in Taiwan. You don't need any of our grub. Leave your guns as well. We weren't sure whether the evacuation planes would make it to our location. If we gave them our revolvers, we would have no weapons to defend ourselves. We ignored them but did leave the blankets we inherited from the Americans. In the end, there was no trouble. We felt awkward as we left, and I really hoped that they would escape from the shitstorm that was coming. I knew this was wishful thinking. We were told to wait at the middle airbase in Clark Field for a transporter scheduled to arrive at a specified time. The lift-out was arranged to take place in three days, and fifteen to twenty of us headed down the mountain with a supply of rice. We hid in a small hut on the west side of the airbase during the day so as not to be made by guerrillas. Late in the evening we walked toward the airbase and found a spot to dig a hole in the ground to start a fire and boil our rice. Surrounding our fire pit with a large cloth to hide the flames we filled up on the rice in what was the first decent meal we'd had for some time. The leftovers were made into rice balls for later and we hid there for a couple more days until the plane arrived. With the stars and moon shining brightly, the night of our evacuation was not particularly dark. Still, with no guiding lights on the runway, the plane would have to make its landing relying on the natural luminosity, but this would require considerable skill. That issue aside, we weren't entirely sure that the plane would come anyway. We figured it was a 50-50 prospect. If it was on its way, we predicted it would come in from the direction of Mount Ariat in the east, because the enemy had control of both the north and south sectors of Clark Field, and Mount Pinatubo in the west was too high. Lying on our stomachs in the grass, we strained our eyes toward the eastern sky. Before long, we saw the small lamp of an airplane camouflaged by the stars a little north of Mount Ariat. Lights on both edges of its main wings were boldly lit up, and it headed to the south route as it approached the runway. As the sound of engine became audible, someone piped up and said, That sounds like a Douglas. The Douglas C-47 was a dual-engine transport aircraft which Japan had imported from the United States before the war. It was not armed, so if we were spotted by the enemy, there would be no way out. We were in a state of disbelief. They really came, we all said in hushed voices. The lacklustre drone of C-47 engine was nothing to get excited about normally, but it was music to our ears at the time. It was sure as hell better than the death scream of an enemy fighter. The middle airbase in Clark Field was located directly to the west of Manila Highway. The plane flew very low and touched down on the landing strip. It reduced speed and stopped on the western edge, raising a big cloud of dust as it came to a halt. We bolted towards it as fast as our legs would carry us. The left hatch was opened and somebody inside was screaming at us to hurry up. We jumped in one at a time, raising more dust. 